Imagine a time when dinosaurs roamed the Earth. No, not in the past, in the future. Well, I've no doubt that the technique of cloning a creature, say, from the past, like a dinosaur, uh, is something that will become possible. In a classic example of life imitating art, an insect is found dated back over 100 million years to the age of the dinosaur. Big Parker. The discovery coinciding perfectly with a major movie based on just such a discovery. Using sophisticated techniques, they extract the preserved blood from the mosquito and bingo. Tonight, could science, should science, recreate the dinosaur? This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. More than any century since the beginning of recorded history, the 20th century has conditioned us to take the improbable for granted. The impossible, our bumper sticker philosophy teaches us, takes a little longer, but not much. We can circumnavigate the globe underwater, powered by the atom. We can see and hear one another instantaneously, even though we may be separated by thousands of miles. We can maintain radio contact with Earth-launched vehicles that are literally millions of miles away. We routinely do what would have been beyond the wildest dreams of our great-grandparents. So why not indulge the intellectual conceit that eventually we'll be able to restore the extinct to life? Not merely the extinct, mind you, but the oldest, biggest, and in some cases fiercest creatures ever to roam the Earth. That notion that we may be able to reconstruct the genetic architecture of a dinosaur from a fragment of DNA taken from a blood sample extracted from the stomach of a well-preserved mosquito is the particular conceit of the book and now the movie Jurassic Park. Michael Gillen is ABC's science correspondent. In the movie Jurassic Park, scientists use genetic engineering to bring dinosaurs back to life. It's movie magic at its best depicting a scientific miracle at its most extraordinary. Can I touch it? Sure. Whereas science fiction movies of the 50s dealt with outer space, Jurassic Park deals with the exploration of inner space. The space within a living cell, within the nucleus of that cell, to the very core of life itself, DNA. DNA is the set of instructions that allows things to be alive and turn into a daffodil or a hamster or a human being. In humans, a typical cell contains 46 chromosomes, which is to say 46 long strands of DNA. Molecular ticker tapes printed in a four-letter code, four genetic chemicals, A, G, C, T, whose billions of different combinations give rise to the entire variety of life on Earth. This fossilized tree sap, which we call amber, waited for millions of years with the mosquito inside until Jurassic Park scientists came along. Using sophisticated techniques, they extract the preserved blood from the mosquito and bingo. In reality, the movie's plot was inspired by the work of George Pointer, an entomologist at the University of California, Berkeley. Remarkably, Pointer's group has just succeeded in recovering DNA from insects trapped inside amber 120 million years ago, the time of the dinosaurs. These days, Pointer is hoping one of these amber nuggets will contain DNA from dinosaurs themselves. I think there's a very good chance that some of the blood-sucking insects that lived during the time of the dinosaurs probably fed on dinosaurs and probably then have dinosaur blood cells in their stomachs. And it's quite possible that we can go into these, into these insects, remove the dinosaur blood cells, and actually get some of the dinosaur DNA. Scientists worldwide are now in an all-out search for dinosaur DNA, seeking it not just in amber, but inside dinosaur bones, and possibly even in fossilized dinosaur eggs. At New York's American Museum of Natural History, however, Ward Wheeler cautions that all anyone can expect to find are fragments of dinosaur DNA. And even with a complete sample, scientists have yet to create a living creature from DNA. 
it would require a whole huge leap in our understanding of molecular biology, developmental biology, all sorts of things that we don't know anything about yet or very little about. And we'd have to actually control all those reactions, not just simply understand how they work. So there's a, a big leap from naked DNA to, a, to a, a living organism. Geneticists may be a long way from bringing dinosaurs back to life, but they are already doing something almost as bizarre, bringing to life plants and animals that never before existed. By mixing the genes of a firefly with those of an ordinary tobacco plant, scientists at the University of California, San Diego, have created a plant that glows in the dark. And at DNX Corporation in Princeton, New Jersey, geneticists want to mix pig DNA with human DNA to create an animal whose vital organs could be transplanted into human patients with little fear of rejection. In California, scientists have changed the DNA of a tomato so that it'll stay firm for up to two weeks. The first genetically altered food, it'll be for sale in supermarkets this fall. What I think we need to be concerned about is First of all, are we informed? Do we know that something's been genetically engineered? Do we know that something that we're eating or drinking is the result of some kind of engineering process? To many of us, it may not matter. To others, it may. I think the, the opportunities that our technology provide uh, for uh, solving problems we have from an environmental point of view, from a uh, uh, food availability and quality point of view, and uh, from obviously from a human health care are rather extraordinary. Last month, scientists at Children's Hospital in Los Angeles used genetic engineering to treat a five-day-old infant, injecting him with doses of normal DNA in hopes of correcting his genetically defective immune system. By being able to intervene at birth, we may be able to prevent the children from even developing symptoms of the disease and, and prevent the disease from ever really developing. Doctors at the hospital are so hopeful of this new technology, they recently announced their plan to use genetic therapy on youngsters with recurrent malignant brain tumors. Look at the wheeling the uniform direction changes, just like a flock of birds evading a predator. In Jurassic Park, the wonders of science ultimately become menacing. They're, uh, <laughs> they're flocking this way. A warning, some say, that genetic engineering is fraught with danger. The movie does say something important about themes that the culture is concerned about. People are worried about uh, situations in which uh, technological capacity outstrips our moral ability to grapple with it. People are concerned, clearly, about uh, manipulating nature in ways that they don't feel they really understand. Jurassic Park shows us what might happen if we tamper with the DNA of our predecessors, but critics are just as concerned about what might happen if we tamper with the DNA of our descendants, the children of our future. Indeed, we are on the verge of being able to correct genetic defects in fetuses, to custom design, as it were, our offspring. It's fundamentally the same technology as depicted in Jurassic Park. The only difference is it's no longer science fiction. It's very nearly a scientific reality. Come on, Mr. Come on. <laughs> For Nightline, I'm Michael Gillen in Washington. When we come back, we'll talk with two scientists, one whose field of expertise is the study of dinosaurs, another whose field is genetic engineering. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Merrill Lynch. A new chapter has begun in Merrill Lynch's history in Asia. We are the first American securities firm invited to open an office in mainland China. Being there gives our financial consultants a different perspective, which makes a difference for our clients. The difference is Merrill Lynch. We call it a unified ergonomic interior design. Ray Campbell calls it his quiet cabin in the woods. We call it high strength steel body construction. Emily Ross calls it a place to put her valuables. We call it an impressive value starting at around $12,000. Tom Reese calls it more affordable than his daughter's wedding. We call it Corolla, the all new Toyota Corolla, the brand new car with a familiar name. 
The military says their deaths were suicide. Their families say no way. I just couldn't imagine the military would lie to me. A 2020 investigation, Friday. Mazda of Hickory Hollow. Hi, I'm Gary Willingham. Your total satisfaction is our number one concern. Come see us at Mazda Hickory Hollow. By popular demand, our pickup or protege offer is continuing. Your choice. Zero down and only 89 a month. Pickups limited to in-stock inventory. And we still have pre-title program 323s for as low as $69.95. Pre-title protégés as low as $89.95. Loaded with air, AM, FM, stereo, and much more. Call us now. We're open till midnight to serve you. Mazda of Hickory Hollow. Call us now. You hear a lot about quality time these days. So we'd like to show you just a few of the activities that took place recently at the Tusculum Hills Baptist Church. Why not join us this Sunday at 8.30 or 10.45 for some of the highest quality time you could ever imagine. Ward Wheeler is a molecular biologist who has himself extracted DNA from a 30 million year old insect embedded in amber and believes fears of genetic science gone awry are unjustified. He joins us from our New York bureau. Robert Bacher is a dinosaurologist, one of those people whose work inspired the film Jurassic Park. He joins us from our Denver bureau. Mr. Wheeler, I, I must confess to you, I'm lost somewhere between the two week old tomatoes and the notion of, of a dinosaur. Uh, being recreated from the DNA of a uh, blood extracted from the stomach of a... Let's get back to the, the mosquito, the notion, uh, and somehow I think the film, and I, I must confess to not having seen it, but the film leaves the impression that it's a relatively short hop from extracting that blood, finding the DNA, finding the DNA, and presto, you're, you're off to a dinosaur egg. Well, it is actually quite a long way. Um, yes, we can isolate DNA from amber-preserved insects, but the DNA that we get is in very small pieces and highly modified. And it, there really is a, a large leap, a huge stretch of DNA that be required to represent any living organism. Uh, how large a leap? I mean, if you can put it in terms of combinations and permutations or <laughs> perhaps related to your chances of getting a million dollars in the in the lottery. Well, let, let's put it this way. Uh, the pieces of DNA that we got were hundreds of bases long. The DNA of an organism is billions of bases long. So uh, it's like having a jigsaw puzzle with 10 million pieces that are all shaped exactly the same way. But you have to put it together in exactly the right order for it to have any meaning at all. And that's the kind of problem we're facing. Is that even theoretically feasible? Well, I can imagine many things. I mean, I wouldn't want to rule it out expressly. But in a practical sense, it is truly impossible. Mr. Bonker, uh, I, I, I take it that none of that discourages you too much. You're, you're <laughs> ha happy out there digging up the dinosaur bones? You bet. What, what is it, uh, I, I, I said in the introduction to you, you were one of those whose work has, has inspired this film. Have you seen the film? I, I take it you've read the book at least. Yes, yes, I saw the film a couple days ago, and it is just beautiful. The, the dinosaurs are captured with tremendous power and a great deal of grace. It's the first movie that presents dinosaurs as we know they were, more like giant hot-blooded birds than, than lizards. Now, there is, I gather, some disagreement about whether dinosaurs were hot-blooded or cold-blooded. You're a member or perhaps even a leader of the, of the hot-blooded contingent. Why does that make a difference? Why does it make a difference? You can't understand dinosaur success if they were cold-blooded. They ruled the Earth when there were warm-blooded animals around. Our own human ancestors existed back then. We were just tiny little fur balls. What kept us fur balls? Something very successful, something big. It had to be hot-blooded the dinosaurs. What is it, uh, and I come back to you, Mr. Wheeler, what is it that is required to take any piece of DNA and transform it into a living reality? In other words, to, to, to get the process going so that you can take a fragment of DNA and turn that into a living thing, be it plant or animal. Well, in essence, you have to mimic the entire developmental process that we went through when we were zygotes all the way up to adults. But we have to start with naked DNA and assemble it in the right way, coil it up into chromosomes, and then turn these chromosomes and genes on in exactly the right order and the right sequence, and then let this follow all the way through development. The problem is that we'd have to control all these processes, that we have a, a dim glimmer of how they actually operate right now. What is the simplest life form, uh, and, and what would the, the number of DNA parts be in the simplest life form? 
Well, uh, if we consider virus particles the simplest life form, there are thousands of DNA bases, and we can, we can work with these. But even simple bacteria, you're talking about perhaps millions of bases. And this, even this is really beyond our grasp. Let me ask you both a, a terribly unfair question. I'm going to ask you, Mr. Bonker, why are you both on the, on the program at the same time? I realize we invited you, but what do the two of you have uh, in common with one another? Why do you care about one another? Well, because the history of life is a beautiful thing to study. What's been lost in a lot of the debate about fossil DNA, fossil DNA is a clue to reconstructing the evolutionary tree of all life. It's another bit of evidence for knowing how weevils evolved, termites, dinosaurs, and ourselves. That's a beautiful puzzle. Yeah, I would like to actually uh, amplify that point. We're really not in any way uh, in any animosity towards each other. We really try to link our work together to try to get a better understanding of evolution of life and, and what happened in the past and also the present. Is there yeah. any way ever, do you think, of extracting some form of life from those, from those bones or fossilized eggs that, uh, that Mr. Bonker finds, Mr. Wheeler? Well, uh, the problem there is, we, again, we may get DNA, but actually converting this into a living organism is something else. I mean, life does not start from some sort of static position. Life is a dynamic process. The once it started billions of years ago, it's continued seamlessly to today. You can't simply interrupt this process and then restart it. It just doesn't work that way. So when you are looking for DNA in these, in these and I guess they are fossilized insects, right, that you find yes. in the amber, what is it you're seeking? Well, in our, in our research, what we try to do is look at the evolutionary patterns of life. We're trying to find out how organisms are related, the sort of evolutionary siblings and cousins. And the DNA helps us to determine how these creatures are related to each other. And that's really what we're looking for. Gentlemen, we're going to take a break. When we come back, uh, I'd like each of you, from your unique perspective, to talk about the morality of what is being done here, assuming, of course, that there is even greater success down the road. We'll be back in a moment. business gives up AT&T quality because some other company predicts a deluge of savings on a long-distance call. Don't be surprised if the forecast is wrong. Leaving AT&T doesn't make a lot of sense. So, did you get my memo? I'm looking for a memo. I got three o'clock. What time is the three o'clock scheduled for now? Let's just untangle this. Give me that. This one is not... Meeting? What made it? We reschedule at 2.34. I don't think you know what you're doing. Four o'clock. Oh. Go in and check. Don't guess, please. Trying to save pennies per call with another 800 service, a furniture company can lose 66 calls a year. At $200 a call, they could lose an arm and a leg. One of the 800 reasons to choose AT&T 800 service, the best in the business. Next time, things women can do to lower their risk of heart disease. Then memories of the USO shows from Maxine Andrews. Plus author Michael Crichton on Good Morning America. I had a lot going for me. Job, friends, all the cocaine that I wanted. After a while, all I wanted was cocaine. I had a problem. Bradford showed me what to do about it. They're a group of caring professionals that showed me how to live without cocaine. You know, you hear the cocaine is the big lie. That's true. Let me tell you another truth. We beat it. Call Bradford Parkside, because it's never too late to begin to live again. 329-4266. If you're not having a good day, if things aren't going so well, even if today is just plain lousy, Beeman Suzuki will cheer you up with super low prices on new Suzukis, including Suzuki Swift's 43 miles per gallon highway. Now only $64.88. Two-door sidekick convertibles are only $89.88. And four-door sidekicks are as low as $10.988 now. Save now on a great new sale-priced Suzuki at Beeman Suzuki, 1525 Broadway. Did you know that God has a family? That's right. He calls it the church. And he also wrote letters to his church, his family. And we call the collection of those letters the Bible. And every Sunday at 930, right here on Two Rivers Today, we'll be listening and seeing what God has to say to his church. 
from the Word of God. Join us Sunday morning at 9.30 right here on Channel 2. And we're back again with paleontologist Robert Bacher and molecular biologist Ward Wheeler. Mr. Wheeler, ultimately, it all comes down to B-grade movies and someone saying, but Dr. Frankenstein, you are, you are tampering with the forces of nature. Uh, and, to, of course, to a certain degree, that's what you're doing. Moral problems with that? Well, remember that scientists don't sort of mix things together and go, oh, gosh, what just happened, you know, and let it go slithering out of the laboratory. I mean, we make small changes and try to understand what's happening. But recreating an entire organism outside of the environment in which it was, it was first created, it's first evolved, would be a, a problematic process. I mean, it wouldn't have the same food, it wouldn't have the same air, it wouldn't have the same water. I mean, nothing would be the same for it. To the degree, and I'll put the question to you, Mr. Bacher, although it may be a little outside your field, to the degree that it is possible for science to tamper with the form or the nature of any living thing, be it vegetable or animal, uh, you got any problems with that? I mean, of course, we've been doing that for centuries, haven't we? Yeah, you know, just selective breeding, what people have been doing for thousands of years, breeding better sheep, be breeding better, better cows or geese, that's a form of genetic manipulation. And by and large, it's been for humanity's good. Now, if you ask me, should we bring a, an extinct life form back if we can? Yes, we sh absolutely. The failure of the zoo, the fictional zoo in Jurassic Park, isn't a failure of gene engineering. It's a failure of zookeeping. If you went to the San Diego Wild Animal Park right now and told them they were getting dinosaurs in five years, those people are such good zookeepers, they could contain the animals, they'd be safe, safe from each other, and we'd be safe from them. It, in, in a sense, it's curious because we do so much to avoid a species from going extinct uh, that looking at it from the other end of the puzzle, uh, I suppose we have some sort of an obligation to try to recreate those things that are extinct. Do you have any problem with that? No. Not I at do, all. actually. Mr. Really? Whitley? Yeah, I do. Um, I mean, these creatures have existed and ceased to exist, and we, I don't think we can simply resurrect them and, and have them running around and expect us to, to be some sort of real situation. I mean, if we build a building today and, and call it a Gothic cathedral, uh, is that really the same thing, or is this an image of what we're talking about? I think we really would not be recreating dinosaurs or getting dinosaurs back. I think we'd have these biological images of dinosaurs. Nature magazine, as you know, uh, has just issued a report on the finding of, what is it, a 165 million year old weevil that was mm -hmm. found in amber? I think it was roughly 120 to 135 million. All right, 120 years. to 135 million. And the significance of that is what? Well, that DNA can last for 120 to 135 million years, which is quite an astonishing feature. I mean, DNA on the benchtop in a laboratory or lying out in the open becomes a meaningless chemical in, in no time, in a day. And the fact that amber can preserve this organic material for so long is, is quite spectacular. But the, the, the amount of DNA that has actually been preserved here is insufficient to solve any kind of puzzle, is that right? Well, it's a, it's a very small amount. I mean, presumably technical advances will ask get more DNA, but we can learn certain things about how creatures are related to each other uh, and perhaps some aspects of the evolution of the molecules themselves. And Mr. Barker, I guess what's exciting to you about this particular find is that it, it is the discovery of DNA that takes us back to the time of dinosaurs. Absolutely. If you get a a well-preserved dinosaur bone, this is the thigh bone of a baby brontosaurus. You want to sort of it, lift it up so we can see the whole thing? We're, uh, yeah, that's it. That That's actually looks quite small. I mean, that, that looks like the thigh bone of a, of a very large horse, let's say. Or... Right. This is a baby brontosaurus, died at about the age of three months. Now, it's black from the original organic material. The blood, the marrow that was in the bone was sealed in a waxy sediment. There is organic residue in here, complicated molecules. We will get fragments of dinosaur DNA. It's just a matter of time. But what's exciting about the DNA is not uh, bringing an entire dinosaur back. What's exciting to me is... This DNA, I bet, will prove that dinosaurs are indeed much closer to hot-blooded birds than cold-blooded lizards and crocodiles. And uh, I, I thought you had sort of proved that already to your own satisfaction, or are we still <laughs> dealing with the theory here? Oh, there are always so, still some skeptics. There are always some doubters. Science is a, is a process of challenge and answer. Brontosaurus itself, from the outside, doesn't look much like a bird. It's got that long neck and massive body. But it's got a hollow neck bones, just like a gigantic turkey. And I bet genetically, in its essence, it was 
definitely part of the bird family tree. Just a matter, just as a matter of curiosity, the, the mom and dad of that particular infant uh, brontosaurus, how, how large would their thigh bone have been? This is one quarter the size of an adult. The adult would be 18 feet tall at the hips, nearly 100 feet long, and weigh about 30 tons. All right, we have all, uh, on television programs and in newspapers and magazines, shamelessly been pandering to this movie. Uh, I, I hope at least it's a good movie. Uh, Mr. Wheeler, anything, uh, anything positive coming out of all of this discussion as far as you're concerned? Yeah, I think that this can get people interested in dinosaurs and interested in science in general. My first love for science came from visiting the American Museum of Natural History to look at dinosaurs when I was two or three years old. And I hope that this will do the same thing to another group of people. Mr. Bonker. Absolutely. I grew up in the 1950s going to the American Museum, looking at the brontosaurus there, the Tyrannosaurus rex, and that's inspired me for a whole lifetime of science. And at least as far as the realism, as far as you're concerned, the realism of these special effects and these dinosaurs is such that even from a scientific point of view, uh, you'd be happy to have your kids go see this movie? Oh, this is a wonderful movie. This is the best special effects of dinosaurs ever done. Uh, the first major quantum leap since the 1933 King Kong. All right. I thank both of you very much indeed. Uh, and uh, it was good of you, Mr. Wheeler, good of you, Mr. Bonker, to come join us. I'll be back in a moment.